So today's class is about mounting orchids in the landscape or putting them on driftwood or um, tree fern plaques, cork bark, stuff like that. Okay. Um, what I'd like to teach you guys today is what varieties of orchids you can put out in the landscape, how to prepare them to put them on the trees, and then how to um, actually tie them onto the tree so that they will grow, and then how to care for them once you put them on the tree. I bought my first orchid in 1995 from a gentleman named Tom Ritter in Orlando. Tom is the gentleman that you know would take a Cataleo or a Phalaenopsis and take the old flathead screwdriver and beat the daylights out of the root to get the root ball apart. Um, he's the one that taught me pretty much everything I know, um, with the exception of John Odom down in Fort Pierce. Um, I've learned quite a bit from Mr. Odom also. Um, I've worked part-time for Mr. Odom at different shows, and I worked down at the greenhouses for a while after 2011. Um, all the orchids that I've got back here today are orchids you can put in the landscape. These are all orchids that will take um, our weather just fine without any problems. So um, the orchids that I'm going to show you today, there are some examples on the property that I'm starting to put orchids on a couple of the palm trees on the property. On the south side of the property, on the driveway, there are two palm trees out front. Um, there are some Tarit Vanda cuttings that I put up there. That's these guys, okay? Um, these do really well out in the landscape tied onto a tree. Um, I probably put six, six cuttings per tree. Um, they will grow up about 20 feet up the tree, okay? Um, this is a great orchid to put on a, on a palm tree out in the landscape. What size of a tree would you put it on the south Doesn't matter. Side? Doesn't matter? That's a full sun orchid. It'll take full sun all day long and not bat an eye. You can put it down on the ground and let it touch the ground, but it has the roots are going to attach to the tree, and the roots are going to hold on to that tree, and it's, it, all orchids are epiphytic with the exception of some terrestrial orchids. That means they're either growing on bark or rock. So um, we're the ones that are putting them in pots or in the dirt. How many of you are aware of what the name of the island is out here? Orchid Island. Does anybody know why? There's a little butterfly orchid called Encyclia tempensis that grows in the oak trees. Um, and they're all over the oak trees out there on the island. And I, I, I've looked on this tree, I haven't seen any on this tree yet. Um, but now's the time that they're blooming. They are usually blooming May through July. Um, and they're a little, little, um, the pseudobulbs on them are really tiny. You really have to know what you're looking for to see them. Um, most of you heard me talk about the big orchid out there on Fiddlewood. It is this type of orchid. It's a Schomburgia. It's in the Catalea family. Um, they grow like a weed in our climate and absolutely do wonderful. It's a Schomburgia. I want to talk about the different types of orchids that you can put in the landscape. That's dendrobiums, cattleyas, and cichlias, which are in the cattleya family, Schomburgias, phalaenopsis. Um, I touched on vandas. Um, I'm going to stick to the basics for today for you guys. The hard cane dendrobiums, like in the tray, they do real well out in the landscape. Bright, indirect light, um, and actually make stunning um, specimens once they get up and get some size to them. Um, remember every year that they're going to put out a new pseudobulb. Every year that pseudobulb, the next pseudobulb is going to get bigger, and it's going to get bigger, and it's going to get bigger every time it produces a new pseudobulb. So as time goes along, you're going to get a, a cluster of, you know, plant that'll put off numerous flower spikes. So 
Um, how many of you have orchids out in the landscape now, tied onto a tree? That's awesome. Good job. Um, a lot of people are kind of hesitant about doing it. Um, there's not a lot of rocket science to it. It's fairly easy. Um, hmm. Who can I use as a guinea pig? Come on, Christine. Christine's my buddy. All right. So, um, when we do orchids in the landscape, you're going to help me because I'm going to tie a vanda. I'm actually going to put a vanda on a tree. Now, I'm going to have to drop the microphone when I tell you guys how to do this. So, I'm going to have Christine help me and we're going to tie the vanda on first and we'll show you guys how to tie the roots on when you tie the plants onto a mount in the landscape when you're putting a plant out all the orchids have root tips all right if those root tips have a chance to wiggle around and move the root tip will die so when you tie them on you want to tie them on tight so that the root tips don't move you want to secure it on there nice and tight so it doesn't wiggle even in a strong wind, you want to make sure that that thing is on there solid and tight, okay? Now, I use different items to tie orchids up on the trees. If it's a palm tree, you can use wire because the circumference of the palm tree does not get bigger as the tree grows. If you're doing it on an, or on an oak tree, or say a royal poinciana, something where the girth of the trunk gets bigger as the tree gets older, you don't want to use wire because it will cut into the plant and cut the plant apart. You want to use a green stretch tape. Everybody knows what green stretch tape is. This is your preferred use and how you want to use or what you want to use to tie it onto the tree, okay? You can use, if you're doing it on driftwood, if you're doing it on um, tree fern or cork bark, you can use zip ties. Zip ties will not bite into the plant and you don't have to worry about the mount growing so it's not gonna pull into and cut the roots off on you. So the... Where do you buy that? Here, we sell it. If, if we can get it in stock. I have two cases of it right now. I've got one case back here. Um, there's more out in the store and we have another case. So if you guys don't have it, right now the supply chain on any supplies for any of the nursery businesses is getting really difficult to get right now. We're hoping with the summer season that the supply chain opens up a little bit better. All right, come on over here, ma'am. Remember, just like a van or like a phalaenopsis, all right, this thing, the, let me explain something real quick. All right, Cattleyas, um, Dendrobiums have a pseudobulb. Everybody knows what a pseudobulb is? Raise your hand. Okay, let me explain real quick. Pseudobulbs, any orchid that has this structure, that has the big bulb, is like a false onion. They actually store food and water for the plant, okay? It acts as a battery. It holds energy for the plant so that the new, new leads, the new eyes have enough energy to grow out. Vandas and Phalaenopsis do not have a pseudobulb. So you have to be a little bit more cautious with, the, well not cautious, you have to be a little more judicious with the water. So with this, you can let it dry out in between watering. These you're gonna to have to water more frequently if you mount them in the landscape. Okay, now like, like the Phalaenopsis, all right, the Phalaenopsis grows the same shape like this. It has that fan structure. If you mount this straight up and down out in the landscape, you have a problem with water collecting in the top that will rot the top of that plant out. So you don't want to mount it like that. What I suggest, and remember, you know, we took the basket off of it. Please don't take it with the basket still on it, tie it to a tree and call it a day. <laughs> it's awful and I see it all over the island. Um, you want to take these things, 
When I put them out, there's a couple of ways you can do it. Remember the roots grow down like a spider, like the Phalaenopsis also. So when you're putting this thing on here, I tend to like to put it so that this isn't sticking straight up and down. That way water doesn't collect in it. This is the way to make sure that this plant will do okay. Now as it gets bigger, it's going to grow up and it's going to droop down and then it's going to come back up. You should, once it's mounted on the tree, it should start putting kikis off on the back too. So you'll get more fans. So you'll get multiple plants on a plant like this. All right, can you do me a favor? Hold that just like that. Let's twist it so that's like that. Now green stretch tape, usually what I do is I pull a bunch off. I get a good long piece. And watch your hand here, honey. You want me to move it? Yep, just move that hand. Just hold it, hold it just like that. Now I'm going underneath the, the leaves and across, across the, the, the root ball. So what I'm doing is I'm actually tying it on there and I'll tie it on in the back at first, just so it's hanging there. So I don't have to worry about holding it up while I'm tying it on. Not on the Vanda, I won't cut the roots off on the Vanda. The fail I will because that's going to encourage it. This thing's gonna put out roots like you wouldn't believe now. Does it hurt if you cut it? Not really, but with the Vanda, you wanna, because it doesn't have a pseudobulb, it can't store food and water, you really don't wanna do it. Um, you wanna try and leave the roots on there as much as possible. Okay. And you can see, I'm, I mean, I'm pulling on this pretty tight. It's, it's stretched out pretty tight, it doesn't break. So I'm going across the top. I got leaves here. And once we get this up there, we'll leave it up there and let you guys take a look at it. If you've got any questions, um, after the class, we can talk about it after the class. Oh, where's the end of that? There it is. All right, I'm going one more up on the top. You see how I'm laying? Now you see this root up top that I've got my fingers tweaking? That's a good strong root. It's got a nice tip at the top. I want to make sure that that root is up against the tree. Nice and tight. And I'm going to come back down here a little bit. I'm gonna leave this one back here. Okay. We'll see how it does. Do we have enough sun to be able to? Not really, oh. but I'm gonna leave it and see how it does for future classes. Oh. So that I can show people. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that thing might go. Yep. Now see, I've got roots hanging down below too. I'm trying to make sure that those roots are tied on there nice and tight. Now, when I tie it in the back, I leave a little piece that I can just pull to and tie. Done. That's it. Now, as far as feeding and watering in it, watering it, that thing sitting there, bare roots. It's got no way to pull any moisture or fertilizer out of a pot. Um, you're not watering it. Most of the time it's gonna get rained on. When you're out in the landscape, you're watering your plant, spray it with water. Just go through. If you've got a pump up sprayer or a garden hose, just go through and just wet it down. I, with Vandas, I'd recommend you know spraying it down at least once a day for the first month. Okay, 
All you're doing is you want to get those roots wet so that it's actually taking some moisture in. And you're going to know that it's actually taking moisture in when those roots turn green again. Okay? That's how you get them up there. Now, Vandas, there's a trick with any orchid, but Vandas especially. If you want to increase the humidity around the roots on the Vandas, go out and collect some Spanish moss. I pulled this right out of the oak tree yesterday. Usually my supply source is Riverside Park. <laughs> I tuck it around the back of the plant. And just hang it around the root system. All right, it kind of hide, one, it does, it does one of two things. It hides the green stretch tape so you don't have to see that. And two, it increases the humidity around those roots so they're going to grow quicker and faster. It's going to establish itself much quicker. That's the way you get a Vanda on a tree. Now, you know we get some cool nights here in the winter, right? Here in this area, when you put a Vanda on a tree, for some reason, it's not like it's still in a basket. If it was in a basket, you'd have to bring it inside because Vandas don't like to go be below 60. On the tree they fare better. There's some symbiotic relationship. It's like a heat sink. So it actually retains some heat and it protects the Vanda. Now if we know we're going towards a hard freeze, I would suggest getting some Christmas lights, wrapping the Christmas lights up around it, wrap it with a sheet if we're going for a hard freeze like we're going down below 28 degrees. Um, once you get to 32 degrees and you're going down below that, try and protect them from the cold. All right, even though we get below 60 degrees, they can handle it out in the landscape like this. But if you're going towards a hard freeze like under 32 degrees, put some Christmas lights around it, cover it up with a sheet or a towel. Okay? All right. Now, how often do you guys, all right, let's say, how many of you fertilize your orchids? I don't see enough hands up. Okay, when we do orchids in, in pots or in the landscape, there's nothing there to give them any nutrition. When you're doing them in pots, the only thing that pot is there is to hold that plant in that pot and keep it secure so that the roots don't move around and die. Okay, when you put an orchid in the landscape, it's not getting any nutrition. Now, the one that's been out on the island for 50 years, it feeds itself now. It's had enough bird droppings, dead insects, dead ants, detritus from the tree falling down in the root mass, and it gets caught, it starts to break down, and it starts to decompose, it naturally fertilizes itself. But while you're getting this stuff established, you need to feed it, okay? A water-soluble fertilizer and a pump-up sprayer Mix it up, a tablespoon to a gallon of water with your fertilizer. Put in a couple of tablespoons of soap. All right, the soap is gonna do one of two things. All right, first, it's gonna make that fertilizer stick to the plant. It's like you taking a, shampoo or a shower in the morning, you wash your hair with shampoo. If you don't rinse that shampoo out, you've got this film coating in your hair every day, right? It does the same thing with your fertilizer. So if you put soap in with your fertilizer mix, it will actually stick to the plant and it won't just drip off. That's the best way that you can feed your orchids while they're getting established. Number two, everybody knows what noceums are. Thrips. Thrips are your number one enemy for orchids in the landscape. Thrips, one of the host plants for thrips is sitting right above us. Oak trees are a big host plant for um, thrips. Grass is also a big host plant for thrips. How many of you have gardenias? The number one host for thrips. Gardenias, you can take any gardenia flower, peel it apart, and you're going to find those little black grains of rice running around in there. Those are thrips. 
Uh, what a thrip does is it lands on the flower, it has a little mouth with a tongue. It has a rasping part and it will sit there and dig at the surface of the flower. It'll come back and then drink the juices that start coming out of that injury. That's why when you get flower buds on a flower spike that come out and all of a sudden they turn brown and fall off, typically it's because of thrips. So when you're adding soap to that fertilizer mix, it's also pushing the thrips back down. Um, I usually recommend like a spreader sticker Spreader sticker, which is a commercial soap. That's all it is, it's soap. Um, and this is what we sell for the agricultural industry. This is what I'm gonna recommend you guys use. Not Dawn or something like that? I don't, Dawn, I, I don't like using Dawn because Dawn strips oils off of everything and it takes the natural oils off the plant. If you're gonna use another type of soap, I use either Liquid Tide or palm olive, okay? Palm olive or Ajax um, or Liquid Tide are the soaps if I'm, if I'm using a lot because I can't get it in the big gallon jugs like I want it, so I go to Liquid Tide or I'm using Ajax or palm olive soap, all right? It doesn't strip all the grease and oil off the plant. A tablespoon to a gallon of water, okay? Nope, peppermints and oil, it will burn the plant in heat. You don't want to use any type of oil substance on orchids in the summer. It's just too hot, you'll cook them. So be careful with that. Um, with the soap and fertilizer, I'm hitting it once a week while it's getting established, okay? Once you're putting them out in the landscape, you need to be watering them every couple of days, if not every day. If it's got pseudobulbs, you can go every couple of days. If it doesn't have pseudobulbs, you need to be watering it every day once you get it out in the landscape. That's to get it established. Now, if we're getting rain every afternoon like we're supposed to, you don't have to worry about watering it. Um, but while it's getting established, make sure that it gets watered every day. Quick question. Um, the one soap, one tablespoon of soap and one tablespoon of fertilizer? Yes, okay. equal ratios. So one tablespoon soap, one tablespoon of fertilizer to a gallon of water. Whichever one you decide to use. Um, I'm gonna recommend a couple of different varieties of fertilizer. Since you're trying to get these things established on the tree, use something with a high nitrogen, yeah, mm, a higher nitrogen level. Um, the Better Grow Orchid Fertilizer, which has the higher first number, the first number is your nitrogen. That's gonna help you get that plant going, okay? Now, I'm gonna suggest to help get the roots going much quicker, add a tablespoon per gallon of seaweed, especially with Vandas. Vandas love this stuff. It'll reward you with bigger flowers and more flowers if you're using liquid kelp, seaweed. This stuff is incredible. You'd be surprised at what it will do for your orchid roots. And with the fertilizer and the soap. Maxi crop, liquid seaweed. That's fish fertilizer. You can use fish, but I, to get the roots established, I would suggest using the seaweed, all right? Um, the Busy Bee Vitamin B Mix, all right? This is um, vitamin E and Super Thrive. I'm gonna recommend that you put a drop per gallon in there. The Super Thrive is really gonna push it and it's gonna do really well with that. Your fertilizer, this, and the kelp. That will get your orchid established and in the landscape much quicker and a lot easier. If you just stick that thing out there on a tree and just go and water it, it's gonna take a long time for that plant to get established and get a foothold. Now, after about five months, six months, once that plant has been on that tree, 
you should be able to take the green stretch tape back off. But you need to make sure that those roots are attaching to that tree before you pull the green stretch tape off. Okay, The green stretch tape doesn't have to stay up all the time. Once the plant's established, it can come back up. All right. Now, this is something from my house. This is a little plant. All right, I bought it at one of the shows. I had driftwood. I drilled a couple of holes in it. I put a zip tie on it. It's been on here probably eight months now. And I'll pass that around. You guys can take a look at it. Be careful on the hook. Um, and you can see the roots are actually attaching to the um, wood. Once you see those roots attaching, then you can take the zip ties off. I'm going to leave the zip ties on that a little bit longer just to make sure it gets a better root growth on that, that mount. Phalaenopsis grows the same way as Avanda. The leaves come out to the side, the center growth comes up out of the top in the center. And you saw what I did with the um, Vanda on that tree. Now I brought a couple of different palm trees out here for a reason. Um, the pygmy date palm and the foxtail. Foxtail ferns are what we call a self-cleaning palm tree. That means when the palm frond falls off, the boot comes off. So if you're going to mount it on the tree, you want to do it down on the gray part. If you do it up here on the boot, when the boot comes off, the orchid comes off. Now, cabbage palms, how many of you have the cabbage palms in your yard? Make sure you pull the boots off if you're going to put them up on the tree um, before you mount it to a cabbage palm. Cabbage palms are wonderful to put orchids up on. They do great. Now, you can see I'm just tearing this apart like I did with the other one. This one's got moss on it. And I'm not being fussy, so I'm tearing all the old moss out of the bottom of this thing. And I'll, I've got a gentleman out on the island. I put 3,800 orchids in his landscape. 3,800. We started out, when we started putting them out, when I first started putting orchids in the landscape, I would bare root the plant, put it up, and then I would take some of the sphagnum moss and put it over the top and then tie it on with a stretch tape. The problem I had with that is it started developing like a rabbit's foot fern and the, the rhizome off that fern would overtake all the roots, choke the roots out, and when you feed it, the fern eats all the fertilizer before the orchid gets a chance to eat it. So I stopped using um, sphagnum moss when I mount orchids in the landscape. If I need to increase the humidity, I'm wrapping Spanish moss around them. Spanish moss does not compete with the orchid for food. Well, I always heard that if you get the Spanish moss from trees out in the landscape, they have mice in it. No. No, that's, no, not, that's, that's an old wives' tale. There may be bugs in it, but that's natural. You're putting it out in the landscape, it's going to get bugs anyways. So, um, you know, the old adage of chiggers with Spanish moss, you don't really see that as much anymore. We're using so many pesticides in the landscape anymore. How, when was the last time you got bit by chiggers? I don't think I've been bitten by chiggers since I was a little kid. And that was up in Lake County. They're a little red bug. They, they burrow into your skin and it's really irritating. So it's, it's really irritating. They're nasty little critters, but I haven't, I haven't been affected by chiggers in years. Yeah. Do you? Are they? They're bad. They're not fun. Yes. I tie the plant on the roots that are on it. Originally, I try and tie some down on it. Um, I try and tie them down so that they are actually close to it. Um, you can't tie them all down, but you can see how the roots are wrapping right around that thing. So it's they're not fussy about it. Now, just like the Vanda, 
Remember, you get, you get a, an access point down here on the bottom. All right, that wants to go up against the tree. Phalaenopsis, when they grow in the wild, like I said, they don't grow like this. They hang, or they hang like this. So what happens next year when you have a flower spike come out like this, these are gonna hang down the first year. The second year, that flower spike, when it comes up, it's gonna arch up and out, and it's gonna reach for sunlight. Now, I brought a couple of different palms back here for a reason. I brought the Robolinis. These are still small, but the Robolini palm is great for putting Phalaenopsis in because it has all that hair in between the trunk um, or on the trunk in between the palm fronds. So the roots love to get in that on a Phalaenopsis. So the Phalaenopsis do great on, on Robolinis. All right, you ready? All right, let's go, let's go here. My pets, okay? Now, before you go any further, mm -hmm. pull it back. See that, see that access point? You want to stretch your roots out like a spider. You should stay down there. Okay. When you go to put these things on here, you're going to see on the bottom of that plant, there's that little point where the roots start from. That's what you want to put up against the tree. Okay. When I go to do this, you put that point right up against the tree. Hold on, I'm gonna tie on the top first. See if I can get that up there, there we go. And the first time all I'm, the first, when I put the first tie on there, I'm tying it on there just to hold it on the tree while I get the rest of the tape wrapped around that tree. And remember, I leave a tail at the end so that I have something to tie onto when I'm done wrapping the rest of the tape on there, okay? All right, let me come around the front, all right. When you pull this stuff out, You want to make sure that it's straight, that you don't bunch it up into a, a string like that, okay? You want that tape to be as wide and flat as possible. That's going to hold the roots down on there and make it secure on that tree. All right, we're going to go down below, and I'm going to tie the bottom of the roots on. Oh, God, it's twisted. Okay. Go, there we go. All right, coming up to where your bottom hand is. Going on. Okay, all right, you can let go for a second. Oh, perfect. <laughs> now, what I'll do is once I get it to this point, I'll go on both sides of the root ball or the root mass, and I'll try and tighten it up on there as tight as I can get it. You still want me to hold it? Nah, it's, it's good. You can, you can sit down now, Christina. Thank you. Everybody give Christina a hand. Now, sometimes, sometimes you see how it's hanging down like this. Sometimes I'll try and prop it up a little bit. I'll bring it around the backside, bring it on the underside, tie it up. Come back up a couple of times.
Like I said, I'm trying to make sure that those roots don't wiggle once I've tied it on the tree. Done. All right. That's how you tie a Phalaenopsis onto the tree. Now to increase the humidity, because it doesn't have a root ball, you use the Spanish moss around the roots, just like you do on the bandas. So. No, that one I didn't trim the roots. I left all the roots on it. Because hers were so long, you want to trim those back up, and that encourages it to push new roots out faster. One, because we took it out of a pot um, that was pretty root bound. So you want to trim it up, you want to get it to produce some new roots. This, I want to leave it alone because it's, the roots aren't as long, so you don't have to trim as much off of it. Okay, that's how you do a phalaenopsis in landscape. Okay, good. Now, how many of you tie orchids on driftwood, bamboo, stuff like that? Same principles apply. Um, you can use cork bark. That's why I round the end off so I don't hook myself. Um, that one's not. This has been hanging in my carport for probably the last three years. These are tree fern root or tree root or tree fern root balls. Um, it's kind of hard to get this stuff right now because of the supply chain. Most of this stuff comes from New Zealand. Um, so it's hard to get it here. You do you? Yeah. Yeah, they can stay in it. This doesn't decompose, it doesn't rot. Um, the water goes right through it. The roots are going to grow all through this ball. You can put orchids on this and, and just go to town. Um, there's one orchid in the bag babies. Which is the Dendrobium aggregatum. All right, it gets little sprays of yellow flowers that look like a cluster of grapes. This blooms once a year, it's usually in the spring. When it surrounds this ball, you're gonna get this giant yellow golden ball in the summer. These are great orchids for putting on mounts. Um, Dendrobium aggregatum, when it goes off, it's stunning, it's spectacular. Only problem is flowers are usually only four day, 14 days long, that's it. After 14 days, it's done. And it's once a year. Now, cork bark. Everybody knows what cork is, raw virgin cork. This is grown in Spain. It is peeled off of, it's a type of oak tree, cork oak. Um, they peel it off every 13 years. The tree regrows it. So they're only allowed to harvest every 13 years off the trees, but you can, you can get this, you can buy it. It makes a wonderful mount. The only problem is um, right now, the, like I said, the supply chain may be a little iffy. I've not tried to order any yet because I've just not gone there yet with Dan and Tina. Um, my intention is to have some here eventually for sale, um, but I have to cross that bridge with Dan. So he's a little cautious about what I tell him to bring in for sale. So far, everything I've brought in um, I don't even have to promote it. All my Orchid Society members are coming in. They're already buying the stuff. Now, cork bark, you can break it down into pieces. Um, you can leave it big like this. I've got a couple of orchids at home that have completely covered the whole thing, front and back. To cover it completely depends on the orchid. Different orchids grow at different rates. 
Um, some of the Schomburgias or Shambo cats um, are going to grow a lot faster and cover it much quicker. Um, the Dendrobium aggregatum is not a real fast growing plant. It's a slower growing plant, but it will eventually cover it. Um, so you can do that. Yeah, it would cover the whole thing eventually. Yeah, it would take it would take it would take about ten years to cover that thing completely. Okay, but they're they're awesome when they do that. Now, I do have problem with some of the orchid suppliers is when you buy tree fern plaques, these come two to a package, and they're good solid dense tree fern plaques. I've gotten them in before from some of the suppliers where they're real thin and they break apart and they fall apart. These actually do not do that. They cost a little bit more, but it's a much more superior product. These things are great. You put a wire through it, you hang it up, you mount your orchid on it, put a couple of holes in it, zip tie it on there, you're good to go. One of the best things that you can use to mount an orchid on if you're just gonna hang it up on a wall or something. So they hold a little bit of moisture, it keeps the roots happy, makes them really, really happy when you put them on the stuff. If you, you can pass it around. I have those for sale here. Um, so if you're interested in them, I do have them. Like I said, they cost a little bit more, but they're well worth it. I've had some, I've got, well, actually I've got a Shambo cat at home on a piece of tree fern plaque like that that is falling apart that I'm gonna have to remount it onto something else. Cork bark doesn't decompose, so once you put it on there, it's on there for life. On the rough side. Eventually it'll cover it'll it'll travel to the back and cover the back too. So, you know, you put it on this side for decorative purposes, but it will eventually grow to this side. It'll cover the whole thing eventually. All right. Now, Anybody that knows me in the orchid societies knows I'm a Schomburgia addict. The majority of my collection are either Schomburgias or they're Schomburgia and Catalea hybrids. That means it's a Catalea crossed onto a Schomburgia. Schomburgia flower spikes can be anywhere from two to three feet, like on the Alba purpurea, the little one on the driftwood, to the Grandiflora, which is out on the island where the flower spikes are 12 feet long. The reason they're crossing the two is twofold. Schomburgias have a much higher tolerance to full sun. The Cataleas don't. So when you cross the two, you're doing a couple of different things. You're increasing its tolerance to full sun, and you're also, instead of getting that 12-foot flower spike, you're bringing the flower spike down to three to four feet and you're increasing the flower size. Schomburgia flowers, Schomburgias are actually known as the twisted petal orchid. The petals are all twisted and wonky. Um, and this is an ex a good example. Okay. These are um, Alba purpurea crossed onto another big Catalea flower. Instead of having that big long flower spike, now I've got a shorter flower spike, the flowers are a little bit bigger. So when you're doing a Shambo cat, that's what you're getting. This, once I acclimate it to more sunlight, will take full sunlight eventually. It won't right now because it's been growing in a shade house. So, but next spring when, you know, or this fall in the winter when the sun's not as hot, I'll start moving this thing outside where it gets early morning sun and then I'll expose it to longer and longer throughout the day. And it will take full sun eventually. Now a lot of the Schomburgias, once they're out in full sun, will start turning golden yellow. So they'll yellow up. They're also known as a banana orchid. Now, To do divisions on these things, you want, if you're going to chop them up and make them into pieces, you want to have at least four of these pseudobulbs on a plant to make a good plant. The way this thing's going now, I could cut it here and I'd have two divisions on this plant. I want to leave it whole. 
Reason being, when I go to tie it on, and I'll use zip ties on these. In Shumbrikis, you can see the roots. So the roots are gonna attach real quick. I'll put it on the bamboo. And you can use bamboo like this. Makes a great hanging piece. Okay, that's on there. Now the intention is, is to take this whole plant, chop it up into pieces, and start mounting it all over this thing. Eventually it will cover this whole piece of bamboo. All right, what I'm gonna do with this Eventually, you can put it in the sun. So I'm gonna chop it up into pieces. Remember, I'm going for four pseudobulbs on a division. Everybody knows Cindy? Cindy's learning. We're getting her there. Now there's there's a couple of species of Schumburkia that will not live in a pot at all. They have to be mounted or they die. They don't like wet roots. Schumburkia humboldtii does not like wet roots, so you have to do it as a mounted plant. Cannot grow it growing in a pot. It'll die. Now the idea is eventually this thing's going to completely cover this whole piece of bamboo. Yep. Okay. Well, this is going to hang. I've just got it standing here to stand up so I can put it on. I'm going to hang the whole piece of bamboo. Does it come out of the cement? Yes. Oh, okay. There's there's a piece of rebar down in there and the rebar just goes up through. <laughs> well, the 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 concrete is only there as a stand. So it's just holding it up in place. Now, remember when I told you guys when you put this stuff on here, you need to tie it down so the roots don't wiggle. DJ's backyard, <laughs> back over here, DJ's got a bunch. We trimmed a bunch recently and I made them save me some because I knew I had the class coming up. If you know people that have big bamboo, just ask them for some pieces, they'll give it to you. Or they'll tell you, go cut your own. Typically that's what's gonna happen is they're gonna tell you to go cut your own piece.
Okay. They're not fussy about this. Um, like I said, with the roots, you want to make sure that the roots are up against the bamboo so they're firmly attached. You don't want those roots to wiggle around while it's getting itself established. All orchids. The nice thing about the zip tie is because it's got a flat edge to it, it doesn't bite into it, so it doesn't hurt the orchid. But once the roots are established, the, the zip ties can be cut off, or you can just go ahead and leave them on there. And how long will this take? Will it be another five, seven months? Um, it's going to be about, I'm going to have this in the back shade house hanging up from the rafter. Um, it's going to stay up in there as an example. It's not for sale. Don't try and take it down. You can hang the bamboo vertically or horizontal. So the only thing with bamboo or orchids, if you're hanging them horizontally, you don't want to hang it on the underside. Orchids don't grow on the underside of a tree. They grow on the top side of the branch or on the side. Good question. See, she is learning. All right. Well, doggone it. There we go. This plant, I expect it to start growing roots on this thing within the first two months. And I expect it to be attached to it by three months from now. And then how long would it take to fill out? It'll take a couple of years to completely cover the whole thing. I'm going to put it in the shade house where it's dappled bright light. It will take full sun. Um, but I'm going to grow it in the shade house just where I can hang it up. And what were you saying about the horizontal hanging? I'll show you guys in just a second. Well, can you just put on brassavolas, um, encyclias, catalayas, bandas, dendrobiums, um, anything with a pseudobulb. Now, the Vandas and Phalaenopsis, you can put them out. Just realize that when you put them out, you're going to have to water them more frequently. Now, anything that you're putting out bare root like this, that means it's not in a pot. You're going to have to water it more frequently. And multiple times um, a day would not be a bad idea either. Now, on the south side of the road, you're going to see some of the tree Vandas tied to a couple of the palm trees. And you're going to see a couple of signs above them that say, don't touch. Um, I've, those were given to Dan and Tina as examples to show you guys what these things will do eventually um, out in the landscape. Unfortunately, we had somebody that came in and was actively trying to take them off the tree and thought they were for sale. <laughs> so I had to put a sign up there. All right, done. Brand new mount. Pardon? I could, or I could just leave it bare root like this. With this one, I'm going to leave it bare root like this, and I'm going to hang it up in the shade house. That way you can actually see the progression of the roots, because they'll start wrapping around. The roots will cover that whole bamboo. They'll start wrapping all the way around that piece of bamboo. Okay? Now, fertilizer, anytime you put anything out in the landscape and... Um, Any, anytime you put any of this stuff out in the landscape, remember, you have to feed it. For the first six months to a year, you're going to have to feed it until it starts building up some stuff around the roots. 
once it's established and out in the landscape, then you can kind of lay off a little bit on the fertilizer, but you still should be feeding it. Um, I would fertilize it once a week in the first six months. Um, after six months, you can go maybe once every two weeks. It just depends if you're, if you get lazy and you forget to do it. Okay. Now the additives to help it get established, the seaweed, the vitamin B mix, I would definitely use on getting these things established in the trees. Okay. Now, um, yep. One tablespoon of fertilizer, one tablespoon of seaweed, one drop of um, vitamin B mix in that gallon of water and then spray it on the orchid. Okay, that will get them established. I'm gonna cut it because it's starting to get a little bit hot. We're gonna do the raffles and then if you guys have any questions, I'll let you guys ask me questions afterwards and you can you know, pick my mind for an hour if you need to.